Wow, that was annoying. So I just recorded like, I don't know, probably like 22 minutes of a video and I ran out of memory. So now I have to start all over again. I guess like in theory, I could always kind of like patch them together, but whatever. I'll just go again. It was practice. So now we get to go again. So I'm in a really bad situation at this point, you know, and I've been through a lot, as you know, as I fucking remind you every video. I've been smashed out Santa Barbara County, riot at San Bernardino, got beat up bad at Victorville. I'd gotten broken ribs in Santa Barbara, stitches at Victorville, multiple riots once I get to orientation. And, you know, just being labeled SMY, when personally I don't think I deserved it, very hard to come to grips with. Then on top of that, I'm a target, so I'm in this like perpetual state of fear. At any moment, I feel like something very bad could happen to me, you know? And when you live like that for long enough, when you're in any situation, whether it be the military, you know, um, I don't know, maybe you have some girl that you're not attracted to and you're like forced in a relation and you're like scared of her. Like, fuck, I hope she doesn't try to kiss me. Fuck, fuck, fuck. There's people like that, that are like in this constant state of fear because they hate the person they're with. I, I think I've always thought that's odd. Like I have friends and they're like, hey man, do you ever hope that your chick dies? I'm like, nope, absolutely not. Why the fuck? It's the kind of thing that someone that would be the perpetrator in a mall massacre would say, my friend. Oh, oh yeah, 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 lame. Yeah, I, yeah. I love my chick. Oh. Alright. I've never understood that. Why are you with... If you want the person that you're sharing your life with to die... You should probably just dump that person and get on a social media or a uh, dating app. I mean, they've made it very easy. You swipe left or right. Pretty soon, it's like you probably like swipe up for anal... Oh, dude, she's, she's, nah, nah, I'm cool. Ooh, I want to fuck this one in the ass. And it's like, anal match. Like, fuck yeah. Then you meet up. Could you imagine if it was like that? And you just meet up and you're like, all right, I got to get back home pretty soon. You want to do the anal now? Okay. And then you guys just do it. And that's it. That was, I'm sorry. That was not included in the original video. That's bonus supplementary material. That's how lucky you are that it went out on me. Um, oh, I don't know how I got on that tangent about being with someone that you don't care about. Um, you know, coming to grips with the fact that I was no good now, I'm not, I'm no good. I don't know what that means. You know, I don't know if there's like some invisible fucking plank that you have to walk. Oh, you're no good anymore, man. Walk off that. Well, where does it go? Well, you're going to fall off and you're not going to be good anymore bitch. All right. You just go and you walk off the plank. You know, you've been conditioned in your mind to, to really look at SMY and PC as, as, as that, you know, it's like a Mr. Potato head looking turd. Like, oh, hey, I'm PC. It's not a good look. This is the shit that rappers talk shit about in, in rap songs, even though most of them have never even been to prison which I've always found bizarre. Why would you glorify that culture? There's nothing cool about it. Nothing cool about it. Unless you like really awkward eye contact in group shower settings, which if we're gonna be honest here, I don't like at all. I've always been weirded out by shower sharks because there's a lot of them. You hear like the Jaws theme song and you just see some guy and he, like, doesn't even have a towel. He just, like, he wasn't going to shower, but now that you're there, he just, like, walks in and gets naked, and you're like, hey, man, like, do you have a towel or a change of clothes? Hey, no. So, yeah. You're like, all right, whatever. And there's a lot of weird people like that, and I've always talked about that. When you're in prison and you smoke weed, especially, that's, like, the weirdest thing because one thing about weed it's never really been compatible for me. Works great for mental health stuff that I have going on now. And I always find it absurd when people say that you can't smoke pot in recovery. 
you know, because that's not, I'm saying my nose is like falling off right now. Um, is there's a lot of therapeutic and medicinal benefits to it. I mean, it's an overwhelming amount of science that backs that up. The thing that I don't like about weed, besides the fact that it makes me really lazy, is that it changes my vantage point. That's not always a good thing. You know, there'd be a lot of times where you get like an internalization from smoking weed. You're like, damn, I'm a piece of shit. And, you know, when you're not smoking weed, you, you find ways to kind of lie to yourself about who you are. Then you smoke weed or you do any drug that takes you outside of your, your default vantage point. And you start realizing things. You have introspection, internalization, all that. When you smoke weed in prison with people, you start to really understand or not even understand, you just, all of a sudden, you become aware of the fact that this person's weird as fuck. Never hang out with this person on the street, ever. You know, like you get, you get stoned with someone and they're like, yeah, man. When I'm not having sex with minorities, hunting duck. Like, dude, aren't you a Southsider? Oh, yeah, dog, hey. No, I, I, I don't know, dog. Don't tell anyone that I, I talk like that, fool. My uncle's wife, fool. And you're like, what? wow. And everything is, like, kind of racially um, separated like that. You know, there is the racial divide. That's a real thing. Everybody looks at things racially. You know? just how it is. I mean, that's how it is out here anyway, but like in prison, it's like very like, you know, pronounced, pronounced racial tension, pronounced racial divide, etc. And you smoke weed with people and you just start realizing how creepy a lot of them are, you know, like you'll be talking to someone and they'll be like biting their lip. No bullshit. I don't have any fucking friends that I talk to out here in the free world that bite their lip when they talk to me. Talking to someone, they're like, yeah, man, uh, what are you, uh, what are you going to do when you get out? I don't know. I'm probably, you know, me and my girl will probably get, oh, you got a girl? Yeah, I got a girl. I got a kid. We're probably going to get an apartment or something. Why are you biting your lip? Oh, no, 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 no. Just keep telling me about, about your family, fool. And you're like, uh, what the fuck? And, and honest to God, there's people, anybody that's done time, you know, that's true creepy ass people in there there's probably a lot of people in prison that have killed multiple 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 people not in like a gang boys in the hood way like a make lampshades out of people and kill hitchhikers kind of way there's a lot of people like that because you got to think people in prison have antisocial behavioral disorder so they're prone to make lampshades out of people. I'm pretty sure that that's part of that definition. I'm not really sure where I was going with all this, but uh, I don't know. First video is better. Um, the hardest part about it was being away from my kid and knowing that my life could, I, it doesn't matter what I do in life. I could win a trident throwing distance contest in the fucking olympics and get a cereal box with my image on it it's not going to make up for the fact that i missed 11 months of my son's life i miss precious moments you know him taking his first steps you know him saying his first word um those are things i'll never get back and those are things that you think about every single day while you're in prison on top of coming to terms with the fact that you're a bitch i'm new to sny i'm a bitch I'm in a mixed yard. I'm not taking off on rats and dropouts. I'm a bitch. I'm a target. You're a target now, too, because you want to go home to your... You're the, you are considered the... You're not solid because you want to go home to your kid. You ask me, anybody that walks out on their kid or isn't in their kid's life intentionally is a fucking punk. Straight up.
And I'd gone from all of this nightmarish shit. Getting jumped, the riots, all that. Orientation, which was the worst part of my entire term. Of any term that I've ever done. And then I'd go to this, like, utopian one yard. I didn't even know places like that existed. There's people, like, ushering sheep. Dressed up in, like, you know, um... Dress up like old, like, you know, Bethlehem era shepherds and shit. People playing volleyball. It's like the kind of environment where you think that there'd be like a talent show. I'm not saying there was, there was a talent show. I'm just saying that it's like the kind of place where they could say there was and it would be normal. Like, hey man, you going to the talent show Thursday? Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about doing the whistle thing in front of everyone. Oh man, that's great. I've always thought the whistle thing was something you should share with the fellas. It seemed like that kind of place, if you know what I mean. People played volleyball, you know? People drank milk. Like, hey, man, this is good for you. I'm going to drink this. It was just, you know, it was a different vibe than being in orientation where every time you leave the cell, there's a chance you're going to die. So I get to this place. I'm able to call Karina. I end up getting my, my time cut. I'm going home in like 58 days at this point. My date changed. You know, I'm telling Karina, shave everything, babe. I'm coming home. She's like, okay. Does your dick still stink? I'm like, kinda. She's like, I don't even care. I just miss you. You're my favorite little dirtbag. I'm all excited to go home. I'm excited to be a fucking dad. It's what I'm most excited about. And I find myself in this situation. I find myself going to the, into the bathroom. Because it was crazy. Like, my friends that I had already known from other institutions were pretty much running this yard. My friend Shreds was the mule. He was a very important cog in the machine for the underground inner workings of the, of the drug distribution and in in being able to actually smuggle it into prison network he was a very important part of it and they took care of him accordingly he had street amounts of drugs you know like they had like digital scales and shit i'm like dude what the fuck aren't you worried that the cops are gonna find that he's like no nah, man no nah. oh hold on i gotta take this he like pulls a cell phone of his pocket i'm not even joking it was off the hook so I walk into this bathroom, and this is how we had ended the uh, the previous video, and I see this, I'm not even joking, I don't even know how a toilet bowl could have such a charcoaly, you know, cirrhosis the liver, anal fucking charcoal, or what, I don't even know how to describe it, it was like black, the whole bowl was 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 blackened with somebody else's shit. Shreds is telling me that Grandpa, because he has some, you know, blown out asshole, can't even. You know, he's been in the he's been in the system so long. Like probably back in his day, they were like keistering samurai swords or something. You know, he, he was like so old. He would probably had like antique lamps stuck up his ass just because things were very, very different in like the 70s and 80s in California state prison system. That was back when, when there were punks. You'd have like a sex slave and they would like fold your laundry and be like, hey man, I'm constipated, but you can butt fuck me if you want. No, nah, man, I ain't in the mood, man. You go, go to the yard and have some fun, man. When you get back, maybe we can butt fuck or some shit, but come on, man. I'm in the mood for that right now, man. Hey, remember, you know, uh, what do you call me now? Papa Bear. Oh, yeah, that's right, I'm Papa Bear. All right, now, no. now hurry along, man. Have fun with the yard. That's how it used to be. And that's, Gramps was part of that era. He so had this blown out asshole. He had two ounces of hash. It wasn't wax, it was hash. Some sort of extract, I don't know. It was black extract he had that up his ass he sat on the toilet it fell out of him and they weren't able to get it 
out. And I knew how the plumbing worked at that prison. And also just, I had like a kind of rudimentary fundamental understanding of how plumbing worked to begin with. You know, typically the pipe, especially in prisons, they go down like this. I remember when years and years before that, when I was in the free world, this is back in 2007, when I was dating Jenny. And she was trying to get me off heroin. We were, I was 22 at the time. We were still in that phase where she was actually trying to get me off of it. And I remember we had gone up to Northern California, probably to go see Paul, uh, because I know that we had picked up in Salinas. And Salinas is the best heroin you're going to get in Northern California. It's in that city. To this day, Southern California is Coachella Valley. Both of those areas have what's called Nestle dope. And it's like this, you know, it, it looks like, it, it almost looks like black glass or something. It's like very um, shattery looking. And it's brown powder, but you breathe on it and it turns like a very, like as black as this. And that stuff is always the strongest you can get or whatever, you know, Salinas Valley and, uh, and Coachella Valley. So Salinas and Coachella Valley. Why is it like that? At least in Coachella Valley, which incidentally was located next to Sentinella, which is the prison that I was at, uh, is, you know, it's right next to Mexico. It's right next to Calexico. So there's probably a lot of cartel members that live down there. And for some reason, Coachella Valley has a reputation of always having the best heroin, you know? Uh, so Salinas, Val Salinas, I think is because that's probably where like some of the high art, I, I always say it wrong, when it, Northern Familia or whatever the fuck it is, the, the hierarchy of the Norteños, they probably live up there. This is just speculation, but those areas have the best dope for whatever reason when I was up there. And this is back in a time where I was doing a shot every couple hours. Like I was strung out like a, like a lab rat. It's ridiculous, you know? Um, I remember like, I'd have to shoot up every couple hours back then, but the dope that I'd get up in Salinas when I was up there, you could do a dime. Little teeny match head of this Nestle heroin and you'd be loaded, not just well. You could be sick and you will get high, nodding out high for 10 to 12 hours. That's how strong some of the dope that I've, I've run a, uh, across up there has been. Um, and in no way am I trying to romanticize heroin. I fuck, I hate that drug, it ruined my life. It's killed people that were very dear to my heart. I'm just saying back in that time when I was strung out, that's where like the best places were. So this, that back then, and I've talked about it before, Jenny was against me doing heroin. And what she would do is if she found it, she would flush down the toilet. If she found out, uh, you know, that a phone number I had on my phone was one of my drug dealers, she would call them and be like, Hey, if you sell my boyfriend heroin one more time, I'm going to report you to law enforcement, which believe it or not, is not, doesn't make you a very popular client of a drug dealer. You know, next time you call them, they basically are like, Hey man, I can't serve you anymore, dog. Yeah. You're fucking, you're fucking Haina. She's fucking stupid fool. She's fucking, she, she wants to save your life or something. What a stupid bitch fool. I gotta go. I gotta go later alligator, you know, and you're like, huh? So, you know, she was kind of on a crusade to get me off of it. This particular time, and it has to do with the, the Sentinella thing. Somehow I'd gotten away from her when we were in Northern California. Like I said, I think we were up there visiting Paul, I want to say. And somehow I'd gotten away from her and I went and I scored 10 dimes of heroin. Now, I already had heroin with me. I had like 10 grams with me. And I was doing it behind her back. I mean, I was very sophisticated with it, you know? Like, I'd go to the bathroom, I'd do the fake flushing, I'd be, like, have my shots ready. Sometimes i go to the bathroom, make a shot, and then I'd hide the syringe full of the dope so that it wouldn't seem like I was doing heroin because I could hit myself quicker. I didn't, you know, I'd like separate it, go into the bathroom two different times because she was on it. Somehow I'd gotten these 10, um, these 10 dimes and I also had 10 grams from, uh, down in Santa Barbara 
she found the 10 grams and she confiscated it from me in the middle. But somehow I had like this reserve. And it was stuff that I was like pretty much treating myself to because it's so much stronger than the stuff I was used to doing from LA. So we get in this huge fight about her flushing or getting, I don't know if she flushed it, but she got rid of those 10 grams that I had. She didn't know that I also had these 10 dimes. So at one point in the trip, we're driving from Northern California back down to Santa Barbara. We stop in San Luis Obispo. It's like a couple hours from Santa Barbara, a couple hours north. We stop at a McDonald's. Now, people talk about how they were just as addicted to the rituals of using drugs as they were to the drugs themselves. For instance, chopping, chopping up cocaine with the driver's license, the credit card or something. A lot of people are addicted to that. Cooking up a shot in a spoon, you know, um, looking at your asshole in the mirror for all your meth users out there. People are addicted to different ritualistic aspects of using drugs. And the thing that I, the, the one thing that I always liked or like the ritual that I was drawn to with using was finding a private bathroom. It was like, I always felt like I was like on some dope fiend scavenger hunt or something, you know, in like a town that I wasn't familiar with. And it like, if you find some bathroom where it's like a single person bathroom that you can lock, you know, you feel like you won some sort of prize or something. It's, as silly as it sounds, if you're a drug addict, you know what I'm talking about. You get into these rituals and that's something that I was always very into. So I end up finding this McDonald's in San Luis Obispo. I think it was San Luis, somewhere up there. Maybe it was Pismo, I don't know. I go in there, and this is after we had been in this horrible fight. And I go end up going into this bathroom. And it's not, uh, no, it's, it's, it's like a single, it's like a, one where you can lock it. And so I put my spoon up on like, you know, the porcelain sink. I have my whole little setup. She didn't find that. And I have this these bags of dimes. Now, the drain, you know, there's like the little drain stopper thing isn't there. So there's just like a hole. I don't even notice this. I'm just cooking up my dope or whatever. I do it and I go to make a shot and I accidentally knock the bag of dimes down the drain. Now I still had the shot that I'd cooked up and I was like, no. But before I panic, I do the shot. And so now I'm like really high and panicking. And I'm like, oh, now she's waiting outside. She's already suspicious, you know, because I'm making like a way bigger deal about her finding the 10 grams than, you know, she, did that shit all the time. She'd find heroin, she'd throw it away. Yes, later on, she became addicted to heroin herself and we were selling it together, but this was still during the period where she was very, very against me doing it. She's trying to save me. So I went out of the bathroom. She's like, you were in there for a long time. What were you doing? And I was like, uh, and I'm, I'm so high, I can't hide it. I look narcoleptic. I'm like, nothing. What are you doing? You know, I always try, you know, I always like, try to flip it like that when I'm being accused of something I know I did. And I, I'm like, do you want you do you want me to order you anything? She's like, you're so high right now. I was like, no, I'm not. And she's like, no, I don't want anything, but I'm gonna sit here and watch you order or whatever. So anyway, so I order the food and I end up telling the guy at McDonald's that I had dropped my wedding ring down this drain. And then I needed somebody to help me get it out. You know, Hispanic guys like, okay, no problem. No, no problem. We, we help. Okay, cool. Now, I don't even care that she knows that something's going on. Like I said, it's the kind of bathroom where, it's, where one person goes in at a time. So I end up going with this, I don't know, one of the managers or something. And she's like kind of looking at me like, what the fuck are you doing? And I walk with him into the bathroom and he puts like one of those, you know, wet floor little triangular things 
on the door so that it opens it. And he's has a flashlight and he's trying to help me get this out of the sink. Well, she ends up coming over to the bathroom and she has her hands on her hips and she's like, what's going on here? I was like, nothing. And he looks at her, he's like, whoa. I'm not trying to get in trouble, but it sounds like Russian or Armenian, but he's like, he, he dropped his wedding ring. She's like, he doesn't have a fucking wedding ring. She's like, that's Chiva. Now, you know, she's saying Chiva because that's like a, his, you know, Mexican slang word for heroin. As soon as she said Chiva, the guy's face goes white, right? And he's like, he's like, well, um, yeah, I can't, I, I don't know probably like a cartel member just working there like on the low you know like so he's not noticed by the government so he stops helping me because she said shiva like she let him know that i was looking for drugs and i remember having like you know i, I get in this huge fight with her i slam the door this is after the guy kind of you know he's being polite about it but kind of refuses to help me after she suggests shiva and i remember like this thing is like this hole is like this big, you know, it's like, I can't stick my hand in it, but the way that the pipe goes, it like goes down like this and I can like see it. And what I end up doing is I take my belt off. She's banging on the door the whole time. And she's like, God damn it, you fucking chunky piece of shit. And I'm just like, I take my belt off. And it's like one of those old skater belts where like, it has, you know, it's like one of those old military belts where it's like there's that metal like catcher thing where you can stick, you know, it was perfect to fish it out. So I stick this belt down the drain. I don't know why I thought the guy from McDonald's was going to help me, but I stick the belt down and I start reeling it up. All this hair and all this nasty shit is coming up. And I see my little bag all scrunched up. Water had gotten in it. There's tars everywhere. I didn't give a fuck just happy to get my dope and of course I keistered it I take this like gross wet matted bag of dimes that I had that I fished out with my belt I stuck it up my ass it was all wet felt like a reverse wet fart or something it's it fucking I, I can remember that like it happened yesterday and that was like 15 years ago maybe even longer um God, that would, that's the point of that story. Well, anyway, you're probably like, well, then what happened? Well, you know, of course she wanted to search me. I come out and she's screaming at me. People that worked at McDonald's were probably like, geez, what's up with these <laughs> fucking white people? Out of control. And I don't know. We, we ended up going back in the car. It, I didn't, it didn't matter to me because I had this stuff stuck on my ass. Anyway, so now I'm in this situation again. What was the point of that story? Point is, is from that fishing experience... I realized that it gets the way that it, that that particular, like, cause you can see the pipe. You can see it. You like in prison, they have very, 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 very strong flushing mechanisms on the toilet. You got to imagine all the stuff that people throw out. People like try to flush their cellies down the toilet. I mean, they are powerful. They're, it's like, it's like a airplane um, toilet, you know, that's like how the velocity of the flush, it's just, it's rah, like roars, you know, it's crazy, but you can see the pipe. It's the same way that was at that. It reminded me of the McDonald's thing and I was able to retrieve it successfully. So it went down like this and it made an L and they were trying to get it out. They couldn't, their hands were too big, probably because they had big old hammer cocks. And I just have this little thing that looks like a, you know, like a cannon. There's this little thing just rests on my balls. And now I'm getting old, so the balls are like longer than my dick. So I just have these nasty, droopy balls and this little ass dick. It just looks corny as fuck. It's hard to like think I'm hot like that. I get naked, I'm just like, yeah, baby, let's do it. And then it's just like these nasty balls drooping down. So I, I end up sticking my hand in. And we already know this, of what happened in the last video. You probably, there's going to be some of the comments. Jeez, man, 30 minutes in. and Sorry. We have to stretch these stories out. No, I mean, I don't know. 
Sometimes I just feel like recounting certain memories. I don't know. Anyway, I end up sticking my hand down there in this disgusting, I mean, ugh, ugh, made me vomit. And the cop ends up coming. He's asking me what's in there. And remember, we know what the stakes are. If I get caught with this heroin, not only am I going to get an in-house possession, which is an automatic year in prison, I'm probably going to get like an introducing contraband. I'm probably going to get possession with intent to sell. I'm probably looking at like doing like two or three more years. And he asks me what I'm doing, you know. And this is after all the crazy shit that I'd been through at this prison already. And I finally thought that the craziness was going to subside a bit. But it didn't. Now here I am in a fucked up situation again. Checks out. This is my life. And he ends up calling the maintenance guy. And he's like, hey, I'm letting you know, because you're being shady with me, whatever we find in there, we're going to charge you with. It'll be a, it'll be an ad charge. It'll be a DA referral. I'm like, that. that's fucking fantastic. And I was like, well, <laughs> of course it would be a DA referral. Of course I'll get more time. That's just, that's what would happen to me. And I was just trying to be a good bystander walking through Grandpa has a loose fucking asshole, plops out a couple ounces of hash. Here I am, sticking my arm in the lagoon, and the cop ends up walking. So the maintenance guy comes, and he's got like a snake, and he's got like other tools. He has a wrench like that he can, you know, open the pipes up with. Now, I'm sure you can imagine that in prison, it's pretty common for them to open the pipes up to have to get into the toilet because people get like murdered and people will flush the weapons down the toilet. And sometimes it's imperative for a case or for evidence or for whatever that they get inside of the pipe. So I'm already knowing that I'm screwed. They end up putting the entire unit on lockdown like, all right, everybody to your bunk. And I'm like walking away. And they're like, not you, Leone. And I'm just like, all right. So maintenance guy is taking it apart. Another CO ends up coming. So it's like three of them in total. And I'm just there. I had gotten a chance. The shower was right there because this was right next to the urinals and right next to the toilet. So I had gotten an opportunity to wash myself off. So I do that, um, you know, just like rinse this disgusting, charcoaly, cirrhosis of the liver, asshole syrup off my arm. And I'm just sitting there, like, I'm not, I'm like, to the point with it all where I'm just like, like, whatever, you know, whatever. And I'm just thinking about what it's going to be like to actually call my girl and tell her that not only am I not coming home in 58 days, but I'm also probably not coming home for a few years because now I'm a convicted in-house prison drug dealer. They end up taking the, uh, the pipe apart. They don't find it. This is like a two hour ordeal and they don't find it. And you're probably like, well, you could have said that in five minutes. You got to understand that while I was standing there, it felt like 10 hours passed because of the kind of dramatic tension that was building up in my mind over the whole thing because the stakes were so high. But what it did do, so they didn't find it. They didn't find the wax. We never recovered that wax or the hash. It's possible that it's still up in Gramps' asshole right now. There's like an owl. It's like, ooh, ooh. And there's like, it's like farting Spider-Man cobwebs out and shit. He was an old guy. But what did happen is now I was on the goon squad and I was on the CO's radar as somebody that probably had something to do with the illicit drug trade at, sent at the one yard, even though I'd just been there a week and I really didn't have anything to do with it. But I was also guilty by association because the guys that I was hanging out with really did have it going on. And they knew that, you know, you're at a one yard that's mixed with PC people. Of course, there's people telling. Of course, there's that's happening in G, just straight up so-called GP units. 
There's a lot of jailhouse snitches. Why do they do it? Because they get incentivized. They give them like free single serving strawberry jelly, shit like that. I don't know what they give them, but there's a lot of jailhouse snitching going on because a lot of people don't have anyone sending them money. Their quality of life is pretty, pretty poor to begin with. So there's a lot of that. You have to, you have to watch out. It's called getting paper shanked. People drop the dime on you, whatever. So now they think that that I'm like some like major player in the uh, in the drug scene there. Not true. I'm just a major dope fiend. Now I had talked to Karina after I got my my time deduction after they took off a couple months. We were all so excited just to be a family again. And my girl's like, "We're gonna come see you. We're gonna drive down to Sentinella." My mom and dad, Karina, and our son, Nico. We're all going to drive down there and we're going to come see you. And that just... I can't tell you like how happy it made me just to think of the prospect of them coming to visit me. Because the only time that I had even got to hold Nico was in the visit room at Victorville. And when they when that visit was over and my my baby got taken from me, it was like somebody had torn my heart out of my chest. Seriously, it was like the worst fucking feeling. Like, you know, they're like, okay, visit's over. And I just have to go back to the hell that I was living at that place at the time. Um, it felt so good to touch my kid, you know, just to be able to actually grab him. Like he's not just an object from a photograph or something. Like he's an actual person. He's my child. You know, there's like a certain power with just being able to touch being able to touch your child, being able to grab him. It's a tangible thing. Um, it's, it wasn't like as electric as it had been built up to be. It's not like, like I always thought that like, as soon as I touch him, like there's going to be like these invisible blue, like electric currents that like come off my back and I start like farting out disco beats or something, but it wasn't like that. And, but it was a pretty profound feeling you know, maybe electric, maybe I was always taking that too literal. One of the things that really pissed me off about the first time that I got to see Nico is that we had taken a picture at Victorville and then I went to the hole. Twice. First time under investigation, second time trying to leave the hole to go pay bills, getting smashed off because they thought that I checked in when I didn't. I swear, I tell you the truth. At this point, I don't give a fuck and I would just be honest about it. I never checked in there ever, never. I, there's no way that I would fuck at the end of my entire term. I, there's no way I'd go back to the yard. There's no, it doesn't makes no sense. I don't see how anybody that was there at the time could even look at that any differently than that. But anyway, it doesn't matter. When I went to the hole, you know, usually to retrieve photographs. When you're in prison, they take pictures when you're out on the recreation yard. And they take pictures when you're in the visitation. Sometimes when you get like a GED, like you'll see someone like in their like blue, like California state prison scrubs and they're like, have their GED. Sometimes there's special occasions where they'll take pictures. Generally in state and federal prison to take a picture, you have to have a photo ducat. So you get like a little like ticket or like, sometimes it's like on the receipt, you trade these in and you can get photographs. It costs like a dollar for a photo ducat. And that was the first time I'd seen Nico and I paid my little $2, two, $3 for a few photos. And I wrote the lady once I went to the hole and she just ignored me. And that was the first time I'd ever met my son. I, I really would have liked to have those pictures, but just thinking about the fact that I'd be able to actually like, like hold him again. It really just, it got me very, 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 um, excited about that prospect. You know, it's just like, all right, I got to behave myself, you know? And she told me that right after the, uh, the hash incident, you know, word had spread pretty quickly about that. Uh, everybody thought it was funny. I mean, mostly because they had pretty much like shut down program that day to bust me. And somehow I'd like barely slithered out of it. Um, but I think also people are laughing at the fact that I was sticking my arm into a lagoon of shit or whatever someone else's shit gramp shit it was like dinosaur poop or whatever 
Um, so everybody, it was like the talk of the town at the time. Now that I knew that Karina, my parents, and Nico were coming down, I really started trying to behave myself. You know, trying... We knew that the the riot was going to pop off. We knew that people from um, from the other orientation, from the four yard and from the three yard, including the guy that had jumped me in Santa Barbara County Jail, we knew that they were coming. We knew that essentially we were going to get a free one. Like we could basically fight those people, and we weren't going to get written up for it. Uh, and everybody was pumped up about it, you know? It was like a way for me to exact revenge. As soon as I found out that I was getting that visit, I didn't want to do it anymore. It's the kind of thing where we were all kind of pumping ourselves up for this riot. Okay, this is gonna go down, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. I was the only one that had anything to lose. Some of these guys had kids out there but nobody had a visit coming up. Nobody was going home that soon either. Like my release date was coming up within a couple months. There was a lot to lose. Now, yes, the cops said that we could fight these guys for free. But you never know what's going to happen. I mean, what if I step on someone's face and they accidentally die? Anything can go. You know, you don't want to... You know, you don't want to volunteer for a situation that could get you in a lot of trouble like that. So, I started thinking a little differently about it. But you're in a weird situation because you don't want to tell people, like, hey, man, my life's more important than yours. Nah, I just can't deal with those consequences. I'm going to sit this one out. Nobody wants to hear that shit. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks either, you know? It's like, I was doing me. I'm going home to see my kid. But this became this real conflict now because I knew that the riot was coming up any day. What we were doing at night, and we'd always say that we'd get intergalactic because that's how stoned we'd get. I'd always like think I was like some like robot like at a disco club. Like that's how baked we'd get off this this hash. We did lose those two ounces, but they had like an endless supply of it. And the way that we were doing it, we were kind of like doing these. I don't even know, these like makeshift dab contraptions. And we would get two razor blades. We'd put them on the metallic locker or we'd put them on the combination lock, the batteries. We'd get a razor blade and we'd snap them in half. Sometimes we'd put like paper on each side so they wouldn't get too hot. And then we would light the, batter the batteries. And if you do positive and negative and you have two halves of razor blade it'll get red hot and we did it very much like you would do when i was in prison in wisconsin when i was in the feds where we would roll up a stick cut it into little pieces with like a razor blade and then we would get a pen and we would basically you know light it up with the batteries until it got red hot it would start sizzling with smoke and you basically like you're chasing the dragon and we would get so incredibly stoned, you know, we'd call it intergalactic. And I'd start getting really paranoid, you know, and that's when the conflict I think was like really just like amplified where I was just like, oh, like the riots coming and, you know, I'm going to be in a situation where, where I could potentially get in more trouble because the, the thing with the hash and the fact that they had come and they had actually opened the pipes and that they were threatening to charge me if they had found it, which I thought for sure they were going to find. That was a really close call. The impending riot was going to be an entirely new call. And, you know, a lot of me wanted to get revenge because of what had happened to me at Santa Barbara. Other half of me felt like I already had. And it was just like, you know, I, if I'm going to make the decision to choose my son and my family over the convict life, then I have to be consistent with it. You know, I can't just pick and choose what's convenient to me. So, uh, what ends up happening is, like I said, we never knew when people were going to come from the other yards, you know, and that was pretty much the protocol. 
when they get to the yard, there's a welcoming committee, dirty, me, whoever, you know, basically anybody that was already at the yard getting along was considered no good. You're a piece of shit for not getting off that yard. And so they had had problems before, like they had had people come from other yards and be like, hey, are you going to stay? And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to stay like a south side or something. And then later that night, you know, they'd kind of like kick back, look at everyone. They'd find someone they didn't like and they'd just take off on that person, like in the shower, like while they're naked or something like hit him in the back of the head. They'd have situations like that. So now they would go out with the welcoming committee because they wanted to prevent that kind of stuff, like people going rogue and like stuff like that happening. So usually, you know, there's a lot of people in prison that have good relationships with the COs. You know, I mean, especially people that have been at the same institution for many years. It's like you talk to the same cops every single day. You start getting juice with them. And there's stuff that comes with that. I've never been a fan of talking to correctional officers just because I don't want something to go down. And then, well, Leone's pretty friendly with that cop. Maybe they fucking, you know, maybe they smoke cigarettes in 69. Who knows? I never wanted to be like in that position because coincidences in prison can be dangerous. So I always wanted to minimize anything that could be misconstrued like that. But there are benefits to being close with COs because you start getting juice. And a lot of COs will give you a heads up when people are going to come, um, you know, to the yard or whatever from the other yard, you know, when they're going to fight. Like a CO will, will tell someone, hey, man, there's, you know, there's somebody coming from the other yard right now. You know, let the welcoming committee know. And then everybody comes up, just like what had happened to me when I first got there. I got there and there was like a herd of people just standing there like, hey, what's up? You're going to stay? And it can be intimidating, you know? And sometimes people throw their shit down and be like, what's up? No, fuck that. I'm getting off. Let's do this. And they'll just, you know, it'll, it just cracks off real quick. It's kind of scary. I mean, there were times where people be working out at nine in the morning. Nobody would know that anybody was coming. Somebody's just doing pull-ups. A couple new people come and they're going to take off on the first people they see. And there are all sorts of people that just got attacked, like doing push-ups. We're like, what the fuck? I was just doing push-ups and someone just came up and kicked me in the face. So we knew that the riot was going to, was going to happen like that. But we were, we didn't know exactly when all we knew is that we had gotten the kite and we knew that it was coming. So I'm pretty much getting stoned at night. Um, I'm getting some tattoo work. Dirty did this Mario flipping, and it has like a dildo finger. He says that that wasn't on purpose, but <laughs> I know your trick's dirty. So one day, about a, you know, a week goes by. We're starting to think like, man, maybe something went down at orientation. Maybe they're not going to come. Well, one day, cop comes and tells somebody that they're coming. And so Dirty's like, are you ready? And I was like, let's, yeah, fuck yeah, let's do it. So we get ready to, you know, get to group up and go to the welcoming committee, see if the, you know, see if what's going to happen. Now, we already knew that it wasn't going to be some one on one shit, that it was going to be a major riot, which which could happen. Like we had inside information that that was coming. So we're waiting for this group load of people to come and all of a sudden it's they, they call us in for four, uh, for four o'clock counts. This is in the afternoon. And, you know, Dirty's in the same unit as me. So he's like, all right, they come in this unit. You and I, we're just going to go, you know, we're going to get down. Okay, cool. So we're sitting there and we're waiting. We know that they're coming. We already have information. Now we're in our unit, which is worse because we heard it was going to be 18 different people. And if you count out like the squad, it was probably, we probably had about 20, 25 people that were going to get involved with this thing. And it was split up because there's two different units that make up that yard. And maybe in our unit, we had like seven. So we really were risking a bad situation if like 18 of them came into our unit and it's 18 on seven. We knew that, that this one was going to be like, this was going to be like the big riot. You know, and uh, 
we're kind of just, everybody's kind of like standing by their bed area. They're looking at the, the entrance door because we know that it's just going to swing open and it's about to crack off. So we're sitting there waiting and we will get into what happens with that. The big one in the next episode. Thank you guys for the support. Um, if you haven't checked out Patreon, check that out. There's a lot of storylines that are different and exclusive from the stuff that I put on YouTube. I've probably, I don't know how many story videos I've put up on there, but quite a few, probably over 40 or 50. You, you know, I did like an entire series on Florida that I'm not even done with. I did um, what really happened last year is a series, psychedelic series that I just started, um, a series about Paul, a uh, series about Burning Man. And, you know, there's just exclusive stuff on there, plus interviews for my documentary, photographs for my cases, photographs for my life, dick shot for a hundred bucks. And uh, that's what supports me. That's my day-to-day -day job and income right now. So if you like my stuff, check it out. There's different tiers. Uh, it's as low as $3 a month, 10 cents a day, extra content. Try to put something up every day. Appreciate you guys. Palabra.